My name is Rebecca Bowling, and I'm the director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities. And this is uh, number four in our Humanities Forum series this fall. Um, and I just want to alert you to um, the next one in our series, which is also a very special one, just like tonight. Um, coming up on the 29th um, of October, we are having Pulitzer Prize winning and MacArthur Fellow, Juno Diaz, reading and discussing his new collection of short stories, This Is How You Lose Her. Now, fortunately, we had the foresight to invite him um, before he became even more famous, um, so he said yes. So um, we're, we're very fortunate um, that he's coming, and of course, we're very fortunate tonight to have the president of the MLA. And I am going to turn over his introduction to my colleague from the Department of English, which is, of course, a co-sponsor of tonight's event, um, Dr. Jessica Berman. got used to being on a stage like this. Okay. Um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to introduce Michael Berube to you tonight. Uh, Professor Berube is the Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of Literature at Penn State University, where he is also director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities. Prior to that, he taught for many years at the University of Illinois. He's currently serving as the president of the Modern Language Association, and for those of you who don't know, that means he's the elected leader of, the, of every faculty member and graduate student in departments of language and literature across the country, which is certainly a big job. Um, for example, in his role as president of the MLA, he's raised issues about access to higher ed, pressed for wider discussion of the role of non-tenure track faculty in universities, while also continuing to make the case for the value of the humanities that I think you'll hear more about tonight. Professor Beirubi is the author of seven books and the editor of two more, as well as the author of many, many articles in both scholarly journals and the general press. Just today, he published a very smart and interesting piece in the Chronicle of Higher Ed called Why I Resigned the Paterno Chair, and you might want to ask him about that in the Q&A. We talked about that at dinner already. He began his career working on American literature, entering into the debate on the American literary canon, and particularly the place of African American writers in it. In his book, Marginal Forces, Cultural Centers, Tolson, Pynchon, and the Politics of the Canon. From the beginning of his career, he was also concerned with questions about the role of literary study and the humanities in general in public life writing such books as Public Access, Literary Theory, and American Cultural Politics, which makes a smart, sane, and coherent case for the role of theory and cultural studies in literary study, and co-editing with Carrie Nelson the book Higher Education Under Fire, Politics, Economics, and the Crisis of the Humanities. In the past 15 years, he has continued to write on literary and cultural studies and their roles in the public sphere, publishing a book called What's Liberal About the Liberal Arts, Classroom Politics and the Bias in Higher Education, another one called Rhetorical Occasions, Essays on Humans and the Humanities, and most recently, The Left at War. But in 1996, he wrote a memoir of his experiences as a parent of Jamie, who's here with us today, sitting over there. At that time, a young child with Down syndrome called Life As We Know It, A Father, A Family, and An Exceptional Child, this book was not only a compelling personal look at the ways his family changed and grew after Jamie's birth, but also a compelling discussion of the public issues surrounding disability. One of the commentators on Amazon.com calls it an ambush and meant it in a bad way, but that's precisely the strength of the book and how it avoids sentimentality. It's been astoundingly successful, the kind of book that gets placed into the hands of parents and appears on every must-read list for families of the disabled. It has been discussed numerous times on the radio, and Berube has been invited to speak about it and the further adventures of his family to groups around the country and in Canada. 
But perhaps most importantly, the book has also played a crucial role in making the case for disability studies as an increasingly important academic field and for the value of thinking through, really thinking through, the public and private implications of disability to literary studies, to the humanities, and to our civic life. His talk tonight is entitled, Disability, Justice, and the Future of the Humanities. Please join me in welcoming Michael Berube. Thank you, everyone. Well, wow, it's very bright up here, but I can see you all. Uh, lovely, <clears throat> lovely building, lovely auditorium, and <clears throat> thank you for braving the rain. Um, I didn't bring it with me, I promise you. It was totally clear skies and State College, and it was only when I got to 695 that the deluge. Um, okay, so tonight I, I'm going to do basically like two talks in one. They won't be they won't be double twice as long as a talk, but <clears throat> I'm hoping you know, somewhere around. 45 minutes or thereabouts. <clears throat> but I want to try to do two different things. And one of them actually um, derives from that subtitle of a, a book that uh, Jessica mentioned, um, Higher Education Under Fire, Politics, Economics, and the Crisis of the Humanities. I, I smile ruefully at that title all the time now because that book was published in 1995. You know, um, humanities, in crisis for 40 years. And which I think is, 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 is roughly true, and I'm going to explain uh, why I think that's so. And so I'm going to get to the question of disability and justice by way of wearing one of my other hats as well. When I'm not a guest at lovely places like this, I'm a host at uh, Penn State. I am the director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities. And I had a similar job at Il the University of Illinois as well. And one of the advantages of having a job like that is that it gets you out of your discipline, gets you out of your little neck in the woods, makes you meet anthropologists and art historians and people. Uh, really from almost entirely uh, uh, across the university, even right through the sciences and information technology. And <clears throat> even though it's a lot of um, a bureaucracy sometimes, uh, putting things together, <laughs> getting people like me here, I always say you know, <clears throat> um, that a bad day in a job like that is not when someone puts, you know, kick me on your back, it's when someone puts, waste my time. A good day is a day I learn something. So I, I'm hoping this will be a good day. But I want to get at the question, like I said, of disability by way of this larger question about the humanities. And I'll be walking you through a little bit of uh, like nosebleed theory. I mean, the difficult interpretive theory stuff. And I'll explain why. Partly because I want to explain not only what disability studies is, uh, but also the context in which it appeared. Uh, Jessica mentioned that my book about Jamie, which is, you know, from 1996, and I, I can't believe it's still in print. Uh, those of you who, who know what trade publication is like know that a lot of books have shelf lives now of maybe three or four years. And if you told me then that <clears throat> it would still be in print when he's 21, um, I would have been amazed. There was a chance I was taking that that book would just no longer exist except in you know, backlists after 10 years. But disability studies didn't exist in 1996. I, I couldn't really make a case for it then because I it didn't know what it was. In fact, a lot of the uh, early books in disability studies and the humanities were being written right around that time. Um, so I'll explain, like I say, <coughs> the larger academic context in which that happened. But first, uh, a few words about that crisis in the humanities. I'm going to go back to February 2009. This is as the magnitude of the collapse of 2008 was becoming clear. New York Times ran a story headlined, in tough times, the humanities must justify their worth. Right? <clears throat> all the professors in the room already, you know, we've, we've read that. But it's all right. If you didn't read it, uh, then uh, you'll have another chance. It'll come back. Right? <laughs> because I remember this exact same essay being published 10 years earlier, in 1999, quoting the exact same people, except the headline then was, in flush times, the humanities must justify their worth. Because right. I'm right, in 1999, we were, it was a robustly globalizing economy, a vertiginous dot-com boom. Who in their right mind would major in the humanities at a time like that? And now, you know, what happened in 2008? Did we do this? This was the people in the advanced financial sector of the economy plunging the entire world into this global crisis, and somehow the humanities have to justify their worth? I, you know, I have to, okay, see, this is my sense that this is going to be like a permanent feature of American higher education. 20 years from now, we will be living in utopia. We will have 100% employment. 
limitless clean renewable energy. If, if, in fact, I should run for office. Uh, a world at peace, a children's park at the peaceful and evocative border of Israel and the Republic of Palestine. <laughs> and we will still be asking ourselves, can we justify the humanities in times like these? And the really weird thing about that Times essay, one last thing about it before I move on, is that it actually admits at one point deep in the essay that enrollments have held steady over the past 10 years. I tend to find that people don't believe this. And in fact, there was an MSNBC uh, <clears throat> segment about two, three years ago uh, interviewing the president of Harvard, Drew Gilpin Faust. And the premise of the segment is students are leaving the humanities in droves and flocking to business. And it's getting worse. These are the actual words. And they put up a chart. Here's what the chart showed you. 1967, a lot of people in the humanities. Um, something like 12, 13% of all BAs. Suddenly, from 1967 to 1980, a plunge, down to 7 or 8%. Since 1980, flatline, stayed at 7 or 8%. I mean, that's recently? Are you kidding me? I think the real story there is 30 years of people being told that your humanities degree will prepare you to say, do you want fries with that? Right? 30 years of, being, of people being told that art history, French, whatever, they have no value in the marketplace whatsoever, and we held steady at 7 or 8% of all BAs? I mean, why is this news suddenly that the humanities are in decline when the decline happened entirely in the 70s? I once wrote a blog post about this, and I said, imagine someone goes with a news story saying, sales of Sgt. Pepper posters are down since 1967. Because <laughs> they are. But, you know, same, same pattern. And then the Times essay also mentioned that the humanities continue to thrive at liberal arts schools. I mean, you would think, well, isn't that why people go to them? I mean, I can't even imagine a, a news day so slow that there's going to be a newspaper running a story. Sciences continue to thrive at MIT. This is what, OK. So what strikes me, though, is that a lot of, and I'll get to this at the very end of the talk, when I get, there'll be the disability center of it, and then back to this discourse of crisis in the humanities, because I also think that one of the things that's gone on in the humanities in the last 20 years is that we now put disability at the center of, of our inquiry that we, in a way we didn't used to, and I don't see that as crisis at all. I see that as something pretty amazing in, in a good way. But <clears throat> nevertheless, there are people who speak, including many humanists, who speak of the declines of our field. And <clears throat> I'm going to explain a few things about why my field got the way it did and why it turned into basically the clearinghouse for interdisciplinarity in the humanities, but also at the same time became one of the softest targets in the academic culture wars. Okay, so I'm gonna start, um, that was all preamble, by mentioning a letter I received a couple of years ago. It was an invitation to an event devoted to the future of the liberal arts, hence the future of the humanities part of this talk. And I think it really crystallized why we have found it so hard to make a case for the value of the humanities. Here's the letter. A traditional liberal arts education has theoretically affirmed the belief in the existence of a certain kind of knowledge or wisdom, as opposed to information or content, that is timeless and universally valuable to the human spirit. Yep, I think that's right. Traditionally, that's pretty much the thing we used to say. There's a certain kind of knowledge or wisdom, it's timeless and universally valuable to the human spirit, and we have access to it. Come take our classes, and you can have access to it as well. That was a good sales pitch. Timeless, universally valuable knowledge and wisdom are us. Problem is, we don't make this pitch anymore. We can't, really, in good conscience. For one thing, we don't believe that knowledge is timeless. So much for that part. Uh, we don't believe that anything is universally valuable either. So much for that part. I think we still believe in wisdom. But we're not going to catch us saying anything about the human spirit, because that's essentializing and homogenizing and mystifying, and who wants that? So for the next few minutes, I'm going to explain how things got this way. Why would we back off of language about the timeless and the universally valuable? I will breeze over the last couple of decades of literary and cultural theory. Though I will be brief, I'll try to be judicious. <clears throat> There'll be one rough patch where I have to read convoluted prose. Warning you ahead, of, spoiler alert. And then at the very end, after I say some things about disability and why and my stake in it, I'll, I'll try to say how we might go about justifying an enterprise that offers a form of knowledge or wisdom that is neither timeless nor universally valuable. 
The shortest explanation for our, our aversion to talk about timelessness and universality is that we are all Heraclitians now. Heraclitus was the pre-Socratic godfly, gadfly who went around Ephesus, what's now Turkey, telling people that everything changes except the law that everything changes. And so you cannot step in the same river twice. Now these days, uh, <clears throat> some of the figures in my field, Barbara Hernstein Smith wrote this book called Contingencies of Value. Frederick Jameson wrote this book, the first two words of which are always historicized. But it's pretty much the same ever-changing river that we're talking about. The same river that is never the same. Nothing is timeless or universal about human knowledge. Everything is time-bound and contingent and partial. In fact, if you try to represent a form of knowledge as timeless or universal, that's probably an ideological move, an attempt to represent the part as the whole, or to claim that the intellectual folkways of one tribe over here, let's say in North America, are in fact models for the entire species all around the globe. So that's it, the imperializing gesture, that claim to universality, right, that makes the Enlightenment look bad in retrospect, because it is basically what allowed a bunch of very bright white guys in North American Europe to talk about universal principles while denying that those principles apply to women or people of African descent. Now, that critique of the Enlightenment, that it claimed to be universal but really was partial, absolutely had to happen. I'll give you a domestic equivalent of it. <clears throat> Look around. Before some people's time, but okay. So in 1987, Thurgood Marshall gave this critique of the Constitution. And to use the British phrase, man, did that set the cat among the pigeons? It was 1987. You know, you, you can only say good things about the Constitution. Man, it's the founding fathers. It's the document. And here comes the only black Supreme Court justice saying, um, actually, no. Uh, it was a deeply flawed document. And I can tell you it was a deeply flawed document because it required a civil war to repair the rupture, the, the contradiction between the Declaration saying all men are created equal and the Constitution's protection of slavery. That document needed to be refined and revised again and again. And he gave this speech in Philadelphia. And like I said, the, 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 storm, the firestorm that followed was amazing. But he was right. I mean, I, for one, I mean, I went to UVA, University of Virginia, as a graduate student. We all knew Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. We didn't know he had <clears throat> relations with one of them. That came later. But you don't want to dismiss that question. You say, oh, come on, he, yeah, he was a slaveholder, um, and he wrote that all men are created equal and endowed with alienable rights, but everybody did that back then. <laughs> That's not an adequate response. I think better to face the past honestly, even if it makes you uncomfortable. So the critical question, though, both for contemporary theory and for democracy and for political practice of all kinds, is whether the ideals of the Enlightenment, one of which was this belief in the universal rights of humankind, were the ideals of the Enlightenment really fundamentally sound and just needed revision over the past two centuries, which is basically Thurgood Marshall's argument? Or were the ideals of the Enlightenment rotten root and branch and will always lead to fatal contradictions and pernicious exclusions? Which is what most of theory tends to say. Okay, one more little footnote about recent history. I mentioned Barbara Hernstein Smith's book, Contingencies of Value, it came out in 1988. Uh, when it came out, it was widely, widely misinterpreted. People accused her of being a moral relativist. Right? Everything is relative, da da da. Uh, and she argued basically that the process of evaluation, and this covers everything aesthetics, morals, any other realm, the process of evaluation is completely arbitrary. And in fact, poet and critic David Lehman complained that Smith's book jettisoned two centuries of aesthetic theory, like that was some major offense of some kind. Really? Only two centuries? I mean, come on, we're humanists. We take the long view. This is very recent, this Immanuel Kant guy. He's a latecomer. You know, he's like the only person in the last 5,000 years arguing that the aesthetic is purposeless. All right, it's an anti-Kantian book. But, and here's my point, she did not argue that evaluation is arbitrary and therefore pointless. Nobody who has ever had an argument about a movie or a band or anything would ever believe that. It may be arbitrary to some extent, but what she argued was evaluation is contingent and therefore inescapable. That's a very different position. I used to have like a fun thing on my blog back when I had a blog. It was called Arbitrary But Fun Friday. And it was an attempt actually to put this into practice. I would ask people, what's your favorite cult movie? What makes a movie a cult movie? Great arguments. What's your favorite uh, a song, that, the cover of which is better than the original? And people really get into this, right? No one says, I just like all music. <laughs> <laughs> 
poison, the cure, it's all the same to me. Everyone has these preferences, and the more they can be explicit about them and upfront about them and sort of thematize them to themselves, the more interesting things they get. So this is just the claim, not that everything is relative, but value is dependent on context. Value is never intrinsic. It's always a value toward an end, toward some goal. Good for what? Now, I said this, you know, this should be uncontroversial because it's part of folk wisdom. <coughs> Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. There's no accounting for taste to each his own. But it does have some unsettling corollaries when you start speaking about political matters, including the claim that human rights are neither intrinsic nor inalienable. This involves at one point I wrote this thing and I said, well, I really love the Declaration of Independence, one of the most important documents ever. Um, but I wouldn't say we were endowed by our creator with inalienable rights. I say we have to sort of endow each other with rights that can always be alienable, and that's why they have to be fought for. And this was partly an answer to a question I got once. What if I were the last person on earth who believed in the human rights of Jamie? And then I died. And I said, this is a classic, you know, human rights tree falls in forest kind of question, right? And I said, what do you mean? How in the world would Jamie have rights that no one on earth recognized? I'm supposed to feel comforted by that? Well, it doesn't matter whether anyone's arguing for his rights. He has them intrinsically. No, he doesn't. That's why we have to be careful about this stuff. That's why we have to pass disability laws in the first place. Now, <clears throat> there's a larger thing at stake here as well. Everything, if everything is contingent, including human rights, well, think of it this way. You go back a couple hundred years. The other thing I love about um, the Declaration is that uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Really? even though nobody on earth believed them at the time? Really, how many people in 1776 going around, oh yeah, oh, pretty obvious, old men are created equal. There's a very much a minority position then, and in fact a war had to be fought even to realize it here. And even then it wasn't fully realized, hence their good Marshall's critique. So before that, we used to speak of the great chain of being, right? Animals, humans, saint, uh, 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 angels, God, and so forth, or the divine right of kings. You could make yourself a, a pretty good living in Europe, you know, going around telling various kings that they rule by divine right. We don't do that anymore. We speak instead of the universal rights enshrined in the UN Declaration of 1948. But listen, also today we speak of the rights of animals. Nobody did that for quite some, I'll come back to Peter Singer who started that conversation in 1975. Because our very conception of what a rights bearing entity is and what a right is keeps changing in that uh, unchanging law that everything changes. Now, I do a very side, very short sidetrack, uh, sidebar here to, um, to queer theory, because some of the most important criticisms of universalism have come from that quarter. Um, early 90s, I guess, yeah, you know, a little over 20 years ago, uh, was the first time that something called political correctness hit the media. And one of the things that was at stake back then was the emergence of this new thing, queer theory, that you know, freaked out a lot of straight people. Judith Butler's book, Gender Trouble, was published in 1990. Eve Sedgwick's book, Epistemology of the Closet, also published in 1990. It was like the major year. And Michael Warner, uh, another queer theorist, spoke then following public enemies, fear of a black planet, of fear of a queer planet. Well, back then, I remember the editor of one of a conservative arts journal, <coughs> Roger Kimball, actually wrote, actually wrote this in print, homosexual themes are not appropriate subjects for a public scholarly discussion of literature. I don't know what literature he's ever read to be able to say that. I mean, I pointed to that almost 20 years ago. It's one of those remarks that just gets more revealing with time. Then 15 years after that, US News and World Report columnist uh, John Leo mocked the transgender dorm and the queer prom at his daughter's uh, institution, Wesleyan University. Unreal, right? But you get my point, these guys have issues. So queer theorists had a lot of uh, reason to suspect that the resistance to their work was grounded in rank homophobia. And in fact, uh, there was a need to defend queer theory from rank homophobia. But it obscured another more pressing problem having to do with this question of the universal. And this is where I'm gonna uh, walk you through briefly some work of Judith Butler's. So, um, stick with me. <clears throat> 
Now, by the time this uh, wave passed, there were very few people in, in my field who would use the word universal without first donning protective outer gear, you know, tongs and stuff. And here's uh, one, I'll give you just one reason why. Butler is a very influential, uh, but this argument is not specific to her. A lot of people made this kind of argument. So this is an essay called For Careful Reading. It appears in this collection, Feminist Contentions. It's a sort of fascinating co collection among four feminist theorists all debating with each other. And this is Butler. What one means by the universal will vary. And the cultural articulation of the term in its various modalities will work against precisely the transcultural status of the claim. Stop there. Uh, in other words, there's lots of different universals or claims to the universal and the very fact that they're specific. Thank you so much. Oh, look at this. There's a Perrier down there. I need to flip it up with my foot. Um, the very fact that there are so many different kinds of claims to the universal uh, that works against the transcultural status of the claim. Back to Butler. This is not to say that there ought to be no reference to the universal or that it has become for us an impossibility. On the contrary, all this means is that there are cultural conditions for articulation which are not always the same, and the term gains its meaning for us precisely through the decidedly less than universal cultural conditions of its articulation. This is a paradox that any injunction to adopt a universal attitude will encounter. Basically, she's saying what I just said. You know. There's always going to be this change, always going to be this uh, contingency. And so you can make your claim to the universal, but it's always going to be fraught by that paradox. But I think this is a, a difficult passage. It's, it's almost wrestling with itself. On the one hand here, the universal she's speaking of is very much not universal. To each his own universal, modulated by various cultural articulations. And yet the universal is not impossible. On the contrary, she writes. What's the contrary of the impossible? The merely possible? Is it that the universal has only now become possible? Or maybe the universal has become a necessity, even though it gains its meaning only through these less than universal conditions? <sighs> Next paragraph clarifies matters a little bit and then muddies them. Next paragraph. It may be that in one culture, a set of rights are considered to be universally endowed, and that in another, those very rights mark the limit to universal universalizability. That is, if we grant those people those rights, we will be undercutting the foundations of the universal as we know it. This has become especially clear to me in the field of lesbian and gay human rights, where the universal is a contested term, and where various cultures and ma various mainstream human rights groups voice doubt over whether lesbian and gay humans ought properly to be included in the human, and whether their putative rights fit within the existing conventions governing the scope of rights considered universal. OK, let me tell you what that one's about. Uh, if you hold that essay up to the light, you can see she's talking about Amnesty International. And she's right. Um, for one thing, I mean, that, I'll, exp I'll explain what she means by that. But also that bit about, uh-oh, if we grant those people these rights, we'll be undercutting the foundations of the universal as we know it. Obviously, that has every kind of ramification for gay marriage, right? If we extend it to you know, these people, then you know, the whole premise of, of the thing disappears. Well, back in the bad old days, Amnesty International did not consider crimes against gays and lesbians to be crimes against human rights as they tallied up their, their scores of, of nations around the globe. So here's Butler saying, you know, here's a group that claims to speak for universal rights, but not those universal rights. Good point. Now, Amnesty International has changed all that. They now emphatically consider gay rights to be human rights. And now we have a whole other queer paradox where you've got some gay and lesbian writers in the West who are hesitant to condemn the persecution of gay and lesbian people in Iran, for example, on the grounds that doing so is kind of imperialist culturally. I can get back to that. But what Butler was doing there, 20, this, is, this is an essay from 1995. <clears throat> what she's doing there is rather different in that paragraph from what she was doing when she said that the universal is always partial, it's always culturally articulated. Here, about Amnesty International, she's arguing that the universal is not universal enough. Different kind of argument. So what we need then is not a culturally contingent sense of the universal. You need a more truly universal universal. Otherwise, if I'm, say, if I'm defensive about Amnesty International, I could just say, well, I'm sorry, that's the way we speak about universalism here. Gay and lesbian rights have to wait some other time. And then there's one more turn to the argument, and then I will leave it. <clears throat> it may be, Butler writes in the next paragraph, that the universal is only partially articulated. We do not yet know what form it will take. In this sense, the contingent and cultural character 
of the existing conventions governing the scope of universality does not deny the usefulness or importance of the term universal. It simply means that the claim of universality has not yet received a full and final articulation. That it remains to be seen how and whether it will be articulated further. Okay. Water. To that, I can only say, what did you expect? Of course the universal might be defined differently in the future. Of course we don't know what form it will take. In fact, the idea that the universal ever could receive a full and final articulation seems to me kind of nonsensical. You have to imagine a future world in which all humans agree on the meaning of the term universal, and we all congratulate each other on finally getting that settled. To put it that way, it sounds kind of silly. But, unfortunately, one of the leading contemporary defenders of the Enlightenment kind of did put it that way. Jürgen Habermas, he was the bete noire of the academic theory left in the 1980s and 1990s, um, not just because he defended the project of modernity, that is the Enlightenment, but especially because he construed something called the ideal speech situation as something that was free from domination, which is good. In the ideal speech situation, no one cares if you're black, white, male, female, disabled, non-disabled, whatever. We all listen to each other as equals. That's all right. But he also defined it as oriented toward consensus, which is kind of bad. And I'll explain why. Uh, he got a reply from Jean-Francois Lyotard that consensus is terror, which I think is going a bit far. Terror is terror. Consensus is just, you know, annoying. But surely there were and are very good reasons to object to a theory of communication that assumes that consensus is the ultimate goal. I wrote this uh, in my book, What's Liberal About the Liberal Arts. My graduate students had all learned to reject Habermas and embrace his critics. Whereas my undergraduates didn't see any problem at all with the idea of consensus. Now, I want to pause for a moment over that paradox. My graduate students all agreed that consensus was bad. All right. I've never, I never got tired of puzzling over that. Now, it's not just about consensus for Habermas. It's also about something called reciprocal recognition. And this can go on even if you're not talking to me right now, which right now you aren't. The question simply is, do we attempt to understand each other, even if we are going to disagree in the end? Reciprocal recognition is not the same thing as consensus. I can try to understand you without agreeing with what you say. And the point also needs to be made that if you establish consensus as the whole goal of communication, that is coercive. It's like imagining all of culture and society like a form of jury duty, right? And political debate as juror deliberation. We don't get to ho go home until we all agree. That will be our full and final articulation. All right. There are other reasons. I, I won't go into them. Uh, there's other reasons that people criticize Habermas. He seemed to privilege uh, reason at the expense of emotion and affect, and that drew all kinds of uh, criticism. I think much of it justified. But I think the larger point is that it is better to conceive of Enlightenment universalism as an incomplete project than to dismiss it as an illegitimate one. And the reason I think so has everything to do with the reading I just did of Butler's critique of universalism. That critique, the way I read it, launches three ultimately incompatible claims. One, the universal gains its meaning from less than universal cultural conditions of its articulation. Two, that some claims to universality are partial and discriminatory and need to be more universal. And three, the universal has not received a full and final articulation. First two claims, I think, are in tension with, with each other, and I think the first undercuts the second. What I'm saying is, if you start by saying the universal is always less than universal, you've got no grounds to complain that somebody else's universal is less than universal. But it's the third claim I want to focus on. This will also take me to, to, disabil to disability. Because what I like, what I like about universalism, even though we don't have it, it may never the cool thing about universalism is it can always be called to account. It can always be called into question. Universalism appears attractive to me because, because it announces a promise whose fulfillment is never fully and finally achieved. It does not dictate norms, which is not a queerist thing. It also does not premise equality on sameness. That's another misconception. But it does say you can always debate if a universalist premise is really universal or not. Right? <clears throat> I'll take a really uh, vivid example from disability studies, from the philosophy wing 
of disability studies. It's still a very small wing, as I'll explain. But Eva Kate wrote this book in 1999 called Love's Labor. And she came up with this disability rights critique of social contract theory from John Locke to John Rawls, two and a half centuries of social contract theory. Her argument was then picked up by Martha Nussbaum in a 2006 book called Frontiers of Justice. The idea is this. The social contract, which otherwise we tend to think of as, as a good thing, right? From Hobbes forward, you know, you don't have a social contract, you got the state of nature, life is nasty, brutish, and short. So we contract with each other for mutual protection. Civilization advance, and now everyone eats at a regular time, and you know, people don't randomly kill each other, except when they do. But they're not supposed to. Well, in Locke's terms, free, equal, and independent parties form societies for mutual advantage. In John Rawls' terms, they establish the principles of justice from behind a veil of ignorance, so they don't tilt the scales to their own benefit. So Rawls imagines this thing he calls the original position in which we don't know where we will wind up in life, and we don't even know what our own interests are. So we don't you know, put our thumbs in the scales. But don't you see that will always exclude people with significant intellectual disabilities? They will never be free, equal, and independent. And they will never be able to offer their fellow, citizens, fellow citizens the possibility of mutual advantage. right? So Rawls says, OK, yeah, disability is hard, especially intellectual disability. We will get to that later in what he calls the legislative phase of deliberations over justice. But Kate and Nussbaum are right to see that the exclusion of people with disabilities, intellectual disabilities, from the deliberations of justice, from the foundations of justice, that's intrinsic to the whole social contract tradition. It is not a bug. It is a feature. You can't have social contract theory without this nasty sidecar where people with intellectual disabilities are not going to be free, equal, and independent uh, players. Now, why give Rawls a hard time about this? He's like the great liberal thinker of our time. Uh, he has a difference principle, that's what it's called, that permits inequalities in the distribution of goods only if those inequalities benefit the least well off. I mean, this guy would never, I mean, he wouldn't get anywhere in presidential primary today. Um, it is so pro 47%, right? And the, seriously, the only inequalities that are allowed would be the ones that benefit the least well off. And yet, by this critique, even that scheme is weighed in the scales of universalism and found not to be universal enough. And here's my point. Only a universalist theory is open to that kind of challenge. Nobody can critique the theory of the divine right of kings or the idea of the great chain of being by calling them hierarchical. They're supposed to be hierarchical. Like, your thing is exclusionary. Yeah, peasant. It was designed that way. Sorry, Monty Python is looming, looming over a lot of this talk. As you, you've gathered, you can't expect to wield supreme executive power. It drives from a mandate from the masses, not from some fossil aquatic ceremony. Sorry, I could do the whole movie, but <laughs> but the whole point about universalist principles is they're, they're supposed to be open to this kind of challenge. If you say something is universalist, anybody, you are, you are obliged to take all comers and to all challenges from anyone and everyone who says that your universalism isn't universal enough. So this is why, in the end, I am with Habermas and not so much Butler on the question of whether modernity is an incomplete project. For that matter, I'm also with Thurgood Marshall. And the study of disability and the history of disability, now we get to this part, has led me to believe that only the promise of universalism holds out the hope for an adequately capacious understanding of humans and the humanities. So if I may, let me turn for a moment, say a few words about my own work in this field and why I think it matters as a branch of the humanities. So 10 or 12 years ago, I was talking with Eva Kate, she's a friend, and we were complaining to each other that philosophy had so little to say on the subject of intellectual disability, except of course when philosophers were finding reasons for excluding these people from their standards for entities entitled to something called human dignity. So for some years now, I've been in the position of saying to my colleagues in philosophy, your silence with regard to cognitive disability is most alarming, followed in short order by, actually, your undervaluation of the lives of people with intellectual disabilities is even more alarming. I liked you all better when you were quiet. And this is personal for me in a number of ways. In his 1994 book, Rethinking Life and Death, Peter Singer famously claimed that, quote, 
To have a child with Down syndrome is to have a very different experience from having a normal child. It can still be a warm and loving experience, <laughs> thank you Peter, but we must have lowered expectations of our child's ability. We cannot expect a child with Down syndrome to play the guitar, to an appreciation of science fiction, to learn a foreign language, to chat with us about the latest Woody Allen movie, or to be a respectable athlete, basketballer, or tennis player." Close quote. Yeah, I know. Jamie's heard this part before. And for those of us who work with people with disability, and especially with Down syndrome, this is a deservedly infamous passage. I spent part the last 21 years watching Jamie rebut it all by himself, but I have to admit that if I'd read that in 1994, when Jamie was only three, I might have fallen for it. I did not know what to expect when we had him. But I did expect that I would have lowered expectations of him. And what I've found ever since is I had to keep moving the goalposts. Or actually, that you know, Jamie moved the goalposts for me. OK, he doesn't play the guitar. We will give Singer that. But he got very interested in Star Wars and Galaxy Quest, so he had a decent appreciation of science fiction. Hey, you. And he has a fascination with Harry Potter. We read all seven books, took us forever. And it led him to ask questions about justice and injustice, innocence and guilt. Those of you who know the series will know that Sirius Black is innocent. He was framed by Peter Pettigrew. And this is his introduction to the idea of framing and of innocence. And as we were reading the final book, Jamie kept asking whether Harry would turn into Voldemort in the end, which is a very good question, as some of you may know. Um, since then, we've also read Philip Pullman's series, His Dark Materials, and now we're making our way through Lord of the Rings. We're almost to Mordor. Jamie has learned the rudiments of a foreign language. According to the arrangement we worked out with a quite wonderful high school French teacher, he took French two for two years and French one for two years. That's reasonable accommodation, right? He has learned some genuinely difficult things. The passé composé form of the past tense, with etre and avoir as auxiliary verbs. Am I taking anybody back? Two forms of the future tense, one using aller as the auxiliary verb, even the fact that he was using auxiliary verbs. Those of you who grew up speaking English, if they're anyone, you, you didn't even know you were conjugating verbs. I go, you go, he goes, she goes, what? Conjugate, we go, you know, this is easy, right? And it really, it was as true for Jamie as it was for me. You learn another language, you learn something about English. Uh, in fact, he learned enough to be able to converse with a very impressed North African man he met in the kitchen of a res in a restaurant of Florence. Don't ask how he got into the kitchen. And he um, charmed young women at the cheese counters of French supermarkets by saying, je voudrais de chèvres, s'il vous plaît. Now, we actually don't have any interest in discussing the latest Woody Allen movie, but that takes me to another level of the argument. I actually had an exchange with Peter Singer about that passage a couple of years ago by way of this blog. Because it only took me about a year to realize that a blog could actually contain serious intellectual matters. It's a blog. It doesn't reject stuff. Right? My, public, my acceptance rate was 100% in the blog. <laughs> and part of what we were arguing about was Singer's phrase, we cannot expect. He kept insisting, oh, we should not expect this of people. I said, no, 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 no. Uh, in, in ordinary English, we cannot expect usually means it ain't going to happen. And at first, he tried to um, do this sort of like little thing with me. He was like, OK, so you have an exceptional son. He's very talented. But unless you can show me that 50% of people with Down syndrome can do these things, my claim stands. I'm like, no, it doesn't. You said these things couldn't be done. I showed you that they could. I win. I don't need 50%. I, need, I don't need 5%. I just need one. And so we were debating about what we cannot expect means, right? OK. But I had two other responses to him. I said, look, you know, I actually enjoy some Woody Allen movies. Um, Broadway, Danny Rose, great piece of work. Bullets over Broadway. Sleeper, still very funny. But I have a larger point. In the 1920s, we were told that people with Down syndrome were incapable of learning to speak. In the 1970s, we were told, OK, people with Down syndrome could speak, but they were incapable of learning how to read. Now we know they can read. So now the new performance criterion for being considered fully human in a universal way is the ability to chat, chat about Woody Allen films, right? 20 years from now, we'll be hearing, oh, sure, they get Woody Allen, but only the early comedies. They don't get any of the more complicated, you know, material of interiors and stardust memories. All right, my point is that these goalposts, right? Then the second point is a bit broader, but it follows from the first and leads me to the heart of what we call social constructionism, which is another loose and baggy name for the stuff I started off with from Heraclitus and contingency. For me, the merits of social constructionism are pretty palpable and obvious. And every once in a while, you say, oh, well, you're social constructionist. You're denying biology? No, no or astronomy either. Um, but let me put it this way. Early intervention programs have made such dramatic differences in the lives of people with Down syndrome that we really don't know what the range of functioning looks like. We don't know what to expect. 
Because what has changed about Down syndrome in the last 50 years? Not the biology. Chromosomal disjunction is exactly the same it was 50 years ago. Gives people with Down syndrome an extra 21st chromosome. That's pretty much stayed the same. What has changed are the social policies and the social practices by which we administer Down syndrome or understand it generally. And that's really the challenge of being a parent of a child with Down syndrome, not just a matter of contesting other people's and certain famous philosophers' low expectations for your child. It's also a matter of recalibrating your own expectations time and again, not just for your own child, but for Down syndrome across the board. I mean, nobody could have imagined 40 or 50 years ago that the children they were institutionalizing and leaving to rot could grow up to become actors. I say acting not because I think it's you know, the pinnacle of human achievement, although, you know, it's not bad. But it requires a level of self-awareness, right, and self-fabrication that no one would have thought possible for people with Down syndrome a generation ago, and now there are two of them on Glee, right? Likewise, a few years ago, I remarked to Jamie, we were late for something, happens, and I said, you know, time is so strange. Nobody really understands it. We can't touch it or see it, even though we watch the passing of it every day, and it only, only goes forward like an arrow. It never goes backward, and Jamie says, except with Hermione's time turner. I was so stunned, I nearly crashed the car. Cut out, man. This is my spot. <laughs> you do a different version of this. There is a version of, of this part of the of a discussion where Jamie actually um, does part of the lecture, but he knows this is not that tonight. But this is, you know, the next thing was, is um, a couple of years ago when we were in Newport, he told me that Jaws 2 was set in Newport, but that Jaws 1 was set in a Cape Cod-esque town. <laughs> Did you say Cape Cod-esque? It is like Woody Allen after all, right? And he does this kind of thing all the time. We were deep in a cavern on the outskirts of San Antonio. I didn't even know there were caverns there. He told me rock formations looked like paper mache. On the outskirts of Denver, I showed him the great white tents of the Denver airport. If you've ever seen it, it looks like tents or meringue or teepees. And I told him, you know, people say it looks like these things. He, he said it looks like Sydney. I said, what? Sydney. I said, no, not the, oh, not, not, not in the tech superstore. But that's this from Galaxy Quest. So you, if you told me you know, when he was three that he would liken the Denver airport to the Sydney Opera House, right? So I took in issue with Singer's passage not because I'm a sentimental fool or because I believe one child's surprising accomplishments suffice to win the argument, though they do. But the point is, as we learn more about Down syndrome, we honestly don't know what constitutes a reasonable expectation for a person with Down syndrome. And there's yet another, I'm going to keep going, this is yet another uh, uh, important principle at stake here. Uh, one of Singer's central premises, one that he shares with uh, philosopher Jeff McMahon, is basically the belief that cognitive capacity is an index of one's moral status as a being. Now, I'll explain that briefly because it, again, touches on universalism. It has to do with Singer and McMahon's advocacy of animal rights. They insist that the only reason, the only secular reason, that humans endow themselves with rights that they deny to animals is that we base those rights on our superior cognitive abilities. In other words, I mean, Singer also has this thing where he always thinks he's arguing with the Pope. It's very annoying. So he thinks that if I say, no, all humans should be endowed with these rights, he's like, oh, you must believe in the soul. Like, no, not really. I just, think, I just think we've made horrible, horrible mistakes at every point in our history whenever we lop off some members of the human family. We're just not very good at that. I wouldn't trust us to do it. So how about everyone who's born counts? Even that's controversial because, you know, some people draw the line not on birth, but, you know, viability or conception or whatever, but for me. Hmm. And then let's add in some animals, depending. Right? But for Singer and McMahon, it's very much a zero-sum game. They say that mere species membership is insufficient for distinguishing ourselves from animals. They call it speciesism, and they regard it as analogous to racism, which is a totally rotten analogy. Ask yeah, me. Species and races are not at all the same thing. Species does have biological validity, race does not. <laughs> Told you I believe in biology. So they argue that we have undervalued the lives of some sentient animals, totally true, and overvalued the lives of some humans with severe cognitive disabilities, which suggests to me that they know nothing about the history of how we've treated people with severe cognitive disabilities. There too, this is not a bug in the system, it's the feature. This is the way their, their schema really does throw in people with intellectual disabilities under the utilitarian bus. And people need to understand that. And I've had this argument, this discussion, especially with advocates of animal rights, because, it, I mean, look at it this way. 
1975, when Singer published Animal Liberation, he was considered a kook. Animal Liberation? <clears throat> now every third person is vegan. It's not weird. There was even vegan food tonight in this very building. And so people have really caught on to this idea that maybe eating meat, maybe factory farming, maybe, and you know what else? Not, not only a question of eating animals, but do you know over the last 500 years as we've been studying animals, there hasn't been one study that's, you know, the headline of which is animals, dumber than we thought. It has gone the other way every single time. So, you know, for a lot of people, Singer is a hero. And you want to bring up the, well, I got to bring up the disability stuff. Oh, I wish you wouldn't. Oh, no, we really got to do that. Because again, it's not just a side feature of his argument. It's right there at the core. You can see then why these disputes about the boundaries of universalism have consequences, right? For how we understand each other as humans, for how we think about what it means to be a rights-bearing entity. And there's another aspect to studying disability as well. I like to say that studying disability eventually entails studying everything else. I'll give you just one example tonight. It's drawn from Douglas Bainton's important essay, Disability and the Justification of Inequality in U.S. History. Bainton starts by noting, as I did, that because the U.S. was founded on egalitarian principles, inequality is not assumed to be natural. Again, not divine right of kings. In fact, if there is inequality, somehow you have to justify it. And time and again, the principle of justification has been disability. It's funny how this works. Why can't the slaves be freed? Well, the argument was they lacked the cognitive abilities necessary for freedom. Similar arguments were uh, offered for withholding the vote and even education from women. It would, in fact, either, either women were too disabled to appreciate it or the education and the uh, effect of political participation would disable them. So women and people of African descent were placed in a very difficult position. They had to demonstrate that they were not intellectually disabled or that equal rights would not disable them, and then they often had to do so by distinguishing themselves from real people with intellectual disabilities, who then were rendered all the more abject and all the more emphatically included. Oh, they're, 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 no, they're really disabled, we're not. So they got, again, left out of the social contract. Likewise, the story about American immigration, I don't know how many, I, certainly growing up, I never thought of immigration in terms of disability, but it is all about disability. The inspections at Ellis Island, which led to one quarter of prospective immigrants being sent back to their native countries were meant to determine, often by really shoddy and capricious means, whether the new arrivals were physically and cognitively capable of supporting themselves. I'll put this dramatically, but accurately. You cannot understand the history of debates about citizenship in the United States without understanding the history of disability. But let me go back now to where I began <clears throat> with these remarks about the status of the humanities in American academic life because as you may have gathered right by now, there's something of a gap between the enthusiasm I feel for disability studies and interpretive theory and the feeling of malaise and despair that suffuses so many discussions of the present state of the humanities. So let me be clear about one thing. I am not arguing that anything I have said with regard to theory, universalism, the enlightenment, its critics, disability, social justice, none of that has anything to do with student enrollment or institutional funding in the humanities. Right? It's not like, oh, we got cut because we started talking about this stuff. Right? Uh, you have to imagine, you know, would students flock to our courses if only we gave up all this theory talk and instead started talking about poetry again, especially the formal properties of it. What they really want is stuff about the Sestina and the pastoral elegy. Likewise, it's not as if taxpayers and parents and alumni and donors are sitting out there with their arms folded. I'm not going to support the humanities until these professors start talking about disability and how it should inform our understanding of universalism. I mean, I think these are two totally separate things. The intellectual content and the excitement of these fields and <clears throat> the widespread misperception in public of what they are and what they do. <clears throat> nothing is more common, I think, and nothing is more wearisome than to come upon these requiems for the humanities, and they are produced almost every six weeks that consist of idiosyncratic complaints about somebody somebody met once or something that bothered somebody that morning. I'm not making this up. A couple of years ago, Andrew Hacker, otherwise a very nice guy, was apparently disgusted that a young PhD candidate would come to his institution, Queens College, and talk about publishing his scholarship. So now Hacker wrote this entire book that says we should abolish tenure and university professors should teach and not write. He actually put this in a book. A, year, a few years before him, it was William Dershowitz, another very bright guy who sort of uh, got sick and tired of Yale, 
who actually wrote an essay blaming his training in the humanities for the fact that he could not hold a conversation with his plumber. So I'm beginning to suspect that you know, sometimes the reason people don't, distrust, don't, don't trust us humanists is that we ourselves write these solemn essays about how our elite educations have disabled us from making small talk with plumbers. You know, the funny thing is, though, that essay, he mentions that the, the plumber is wearing a Red Sox cap and talks with a thick Boston accent. And if you can't even say a few words to a guy like that about the recent history of the Red Sox, that's not the fault of your elite education. That's just you. Sociability fail. I know it's a guy thing, but you know, still, these were guys. Around the same time, Dershowitz published an essay in The Nation, in which he wrote, and part of the framing of this talk is a response to this. In literary studies in particular, he writes, the last several decades have witnessed the baleful reign of theory, a mashup of Derridian deconstruction, Foucauldian social theory, Lacanian psychoanalysis, and other assorted abstrusiosities, the overall tendency of which has been to cut the field off from society at large and from the main currents of academic thought, not to mention the common reader and common sense. All right, well, the claim that theory cut the field off from the main currents of academic thought is simply wrong because theory is actually an interdisciplinary phenomenon. It's how different disciplines started talking to each other in the first place. Not only cutting across disciplines, but helping to create new sort of interstitial areas of knowledge in between the disciplines. But then there's this claim that theory cut the field off from common sense. And that's what really gets me. Apart, permit me a, a bloggy tangent. <clears throat> Back in <clears throat> 2005, I think it was, it was this very funny blog called Faf Blog. They would publish these uh, mock interviews, and one of them was the interview with uh, an interview with James Dobson of on Focus on the Family, and you'll see its relevance to this talk. Faf Blog says, "I thought gay people were good and deserved marriage licenses." Dobson says, "That's probably because of your treasonous liberal education. It's brainwashed you into thinking that there is no right and wrong, that everyone deserves equal rights, and that the fossil record accurately represents the geological and biological history of the Earth." If our society continues to slip down the slippery slope, slide down the slippery slope of moral relativism, it will mean the end of Western civilization. Faf blog. Oh no, not Western civilization. That's where all my friends live. <laughs> so when I hear that literary theory has cut us off from common sense, that's what I say. Oh, not common sense. That's where all my friends live. You know, seriously, if the humanities were dedicated to the reiteration and reinforcement of common sense, why would they be worth a lifetime of study? Uh, it's well and good to snark at silliness like this, so I do it. But the question remains, right? Look, if we no longer believe that there's a certain kind of knowledge or wisdom that is timeless and universally valuable to the human spirit, what do we tell people about the value of what we do? How do we even justify including disability studies in a curriculum, right? Is it possible to make the case for the humanities without going back to the bromides of the admissions brochure? Should we simply pretend that the past 30 years of intellectual history didn't happen, that it was all a wrong turn? It's like a page from the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. We will just erase our awareness of the last 30, 40 years. We will forget that we argued that value was contingent. Oh, and another famous slogan, the sign is arbitrary. It is arbitrary, folks. There's no reason why a thing like this, we, or my favorite example from Penn State, it's an actual sign. It's by the student center parking garage, and it says pedestrians look both ways. I said, bullshit, they do. <laughs> I've never seen a pedestrian look both ways. So it's totally wrong. But of course, you know that's not what the sign is doing, right? The sign is a cultural construction read by certain cultural conventions, and you know it's an exhortation to be ignored, and not a statement of the state of affairs. Once upon a time, about seven years ago, I was in a long blog dispute between friends and foes of interpretive theory, and I wondered if we put out, you know, would everyone be satisfied if we put out a news bulletin, this just in, the sign is not arbitrary after all. Can we do that? I mean, can you imagine a, a bulletin that says, okay, from now on, words will have straightforward singular meanings, and meaning itself will be stable. Done. Or should we say, you know, it was a mistake to develop this new field of disability studies. We're going to go back to the days when disciplines of philosophy, history, and literature kept it in the margins and did not address it altogether. Of course not. Right? These cows are not going back in that barn, and I am not hurting them. Instead, I'm going to say that the liberal arts we now practice the disciplines of the humanities that emphasize historical change and the contingency of value are not only more adequate to the world we live in, but actually more exciting intellectually. I mean, the world is a, a world in which the meaning and value of Shakespeare or Sophocles or Stephen King is not fixed once and for all, 
but always open for continued discussion and contestation, as they manifestly are. It's a world in which race and gender and sexuality and disability are not defined once and for all, but susceptible to slippage and performativity and change, as they manifestly are. And again, in another talk, I could go over the way different societies have defined disability over the years. You think it's a stable thing, you think it's either bodily or mental, not really. The Greeks were totally squicked out by congenital deformity. It's like a sign from the gods. Mild intellectual disability, no problem. In fact, most pre-industrial societies, not really a problem. To put this another way, it may seem to some of you that this attempt here to ask about the question of the value of the humanities by walking through the last couple of decades of theory is kind of perverse, right? It might even be a symptom of the problem. You know, you ask a humanist to speak about the cultural and social consequences of, of their work, and in response, we, we mumble to each other a string of incomprehensible things about cryptonormativity and hybridity and the social construction of enunciative modalities. I can do that in my sleep. And perhaps to some of you, this might sound strange to hear disability discussed in the context of theory. But I believe that disability brings new and important considerations to that discussion, just as it has revised our understanding of social contract theory. And even when I disagree with sweeping denunciations of the Enlightenment and its legacy, I believe with all my heart that arguing about things like universalism is precisely what we're supposed to be doing in this business. Learning and debating the history of universalist aspirations and challenges to it with reference to race and gender and nationality and sexuality and disability, basically this is what gets me out of bed in the morning. I think it is a path of a form of, to a form of wisdom, a deeper understanding of human affairs. It is sometimes said that the humanities teach us how to understand difference, again, brochure rhetoric, some sort of generally tolerant way. I would like to believe this. I would, I would like to believe that when people become acquainted with the history of human thought and the astonishing variety of the artifacts of the human imagination, then they're more likely to see the world with a sense of wonder and with a livelier sense that any one of us might be wrong or perhaps only partially right, with an awareness that the world was not always this way, it could always be imagined otherwise, and with what Buddhists call beginner's mind. That's just what I like to believe. If you want to, you can puncture that belief by reminding me daily that the architects of the Holocaust were also intelligent and cultured men. I'm aware of that. In fact, you, you can actually just temper my optimism more gently by saying, look, there's no way to ensure that training in the humanities leads to anyone's moral improvement or any, even to anyone's greater happiness. Think of all the times when greater knowledge has nothing to do with greater happiness. And as for understanding difference, eh, we all seem to wind up in the end with different ways of understanding difference. But I do think the humanities might help us to grapple with the stubborn fact that some forms of difference might really be unresolvable. Some forms of conflict might be intractable. And what happens then is the real question. That stubborn fact takes many shapes, from the trivial to the critical. In one of its guises, it poses us to the question of how to develop and how to maintain pluralist societies that contain people who aren't pluralists. Some of them who really kind of hate pluralists. Is it right and just to exclude the excluders? Or is it arrogant and imperialist to campaign for gay rights and women right, women's rights around the globe? What are our obligations to our descendants and to our fellow species? What are the appropriate limits to genetic screening and prenatal screening and diagnosis, and genetic engineering? Answering those questions requires really extraordinary suppleness of mind and a willingness to think in ways that really don't immediately reach very easy resolution. It requires what Keats called negative capability. So an education in the humanities and an understanding of disability is not really a guarantee or a guarantor of anything, but it might enhance our ability to imagine incommensurability and to question whether when we see an impasse like that, is it really incommensurable or just a trivial dispute, masking a uh, broader underlying agreement? The question here really is nothing less and nothing other than the question of how we individually and collectively are to lead our lives. It's a question that has vexed us for as long as we can remember. It's a question really would only be definitively answered by our extinction, which we may yet bring about, dragging any number of species with us. But until then, I think we should make the case as forcefully as possible. The humanities are disciplines of lifelong learning not providers of tasty desserts in a meal whose main courses consist of business administration and technology transfer. There are all too many people at every university who see the humanities as dessert, or even worse, as a poison pill. And I know it is an open question as to whether universities will continue to be places that try to foster lifelong learning, or whether it's all gonna be about vocational training. <laughs>
So that is why it really won't suffice to see the humanities as just a study of fine objects and timeless truths. We should rather see the humanities as the study of what it means and has meant and might yet mean to be human in a world where the human itself is a variable term, its definition challenged and revised time and time again. We should say that what we offer is not the prospect of a better life, can't, can't promise you that, but the promise of an examined life. And just as the universal has not yet achieved its final articulation, we could say that our disciplines offer no final examination. Thank you. Can't imagine, qu yeah, sure. Of course, I'll be happy to take questions about anything and everything. Great question. I mean, one of the problems, which I think is one of the wonderful enabling conditions of disability studies, is the ever-shifting understanding of what disability is. And, <coughs> excuse me, on the one hand, it makes it very hard to legislate, right? Because hard cases make bad law, and there's nothing but a bunch of hard cases when it comes to disability and employment and disability and rights. It has also, I think, made disability um, singularly less effective politically as a constituency than other identities. It, it, the phrase in, in um, it, it's not a discrete and distinct minority, in other words. <coughs> Excuse me. That may, no, I don't want to do that. So, for example, uh, and this is one of the things that the courts have had a lot, a lot of trouble with. You named a variety of different disabilities that in various contexts may or may not be disability. There's a very, it, it's hard to do dis disability humor, but the movie Music Within, which is about Richard Pimentel, who created this employment program for people with disabilities, has this moment where he's trying to find employment for this, this woman who's about three feet tall. And he's clearly getting the question from the employer, you know, can she file? And she's like, yes, I use a stool. And he says to the employer, she just does A through M. You know, <laughs> I mean, have, in what sense, right? or for that matter, in a more sort of cosmic sense, think of all the contexts in which it is not a disability to be deaf, right? If you're trying to sit and read, and you can't hear the annoying couple behind you on the plane or in the coffee shop, you got one up on me, because I can't tune them out. And Likewise, I mean, think of all the times you've used closed captioning in the bar, right, because you just can't hear the, the TV over the buzz. But thank goodness, somebody, you know, with an eye toward universal design, you know, put up closed captioning for you. So the reason I go into that little tangent is, um, what courts have done overwhelmingly is to try to determine who does or doesn't have a disability. And they've done that to try to reduce the number of potential plaintiffs. And they never, they rarely ask whether the disability is a disability in context. So, um, there was this case uh, in 2002, Toyota v. Williams. Ms. Williams developed really severe carpal tunnel. And uh, she was working at the Toyota plant. It couldn't raise her arms above her head. And uh, Toyota tried to move her around. They actually made a, some, some attempt to accommodate her and eventually it just didn't work. She was let go, she sued, and the Supreme Court held against her nine nothing, went all the way to the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court didn't say Toyota did what it could. The Supreme Court said this woman's not really disabled because the ADA says you're disabled if you're disabled in a major life activity and she can brush her teeth. So I wrote a paper in response to this called Can You Brush Your Teeth for a Living? Um, because of course the real point there is you know, whether in context, in the context of the employment, you could say, look, Toyota did its best, I'm sorry they made in a reasonable accommodation, any more than that would have been undue hardship on the employer. But the Supreme Court instead went for this most, you know, sort of dunderheaded possible reasoning 
And of course, when I wrote about this it was in the New York Times about 10 years ago, I couldn't help but add, actually, uh, brushing your teeth has only been considered a major life activity by a very small portion of the globe for a very small portion of human history. Um, it was a very strange criterion to, to invoke. But it makes it a really difficult category to administer, but an incredibly rich category to think about intellectually, especially when you get into these various definitions of which societies and which cultures consider which dis disabilities disabling in which circumstances. And then, of course, there is even the uh, um, I have a whole different riff on the way in certain popular film disability is man imagined as super ability, especially with regard to these days to autism. But it's also there in Dumbo, because that's a kid with a disability. And you should see the way the other circus elephant mothers treat Dumbo's mother. They drive her into madness. She has to be locked up. Also disability. But it turns out the guy can fly. Ta-da! He's Dumbo the flying elephant. Happy feet. Obviously a kid with disability. Something went wrong in the South Pole there. His father wasn't sitting on him properly and as the egg was developing. And so he's the only penguin who can't sing. But man, he can tap dance. Super ability. And there's this rich tradition of this as well, of, you know, uh, of seeing epilepsy as a divine disease, seeing forms of intellectual disability as actually um, signs of God's grace or God's wrath. And like I said, it it's, makes it incredibly difficult to deal with bit by bit, but as a field, you know, again, I don't have to, I don't have to win cases. I get to just get to talk about them. And opening uh, students' eyes to the range of things that they never even thought of with regard to ability and disability has been a great deal of fun. Last thing first, probably not. <clears throat> you know, it was fun while it lasted, and I meant that little aside that I was about eight months in before I realized that I actually could post my class notes on, on a, a Jacques Derrida essay. It was good enough to, to, to give to undergraduate students. I can put it on the blog. And it generated a lot of discussion. And um, that for the longest time, the, the, the blog was such fun because I could do that while also writing some very silly things about how, all right, for a couple of years, I was the best Super Bowl prognosticator in the blogosphere because only I understood that in the Super Bowl, the only thing that matters is which team has the more masculine jersey. <laughs> Think about it. Denver Broncos with orange, very bad. Denver Broncos with dark blue and angry horse head, very good. Okay. There's other examples, but okay. So I mean, it was this wide range of stuff and I'm uh, also buying time before I get around to the paternal part of the question. Um, I don't know how I would read that whole episode in terms of common sense. Um, I do know that at some point between the moment the grand jury presentation broke, um, when, that, when that news broke back in the first weekend of November of 2011, Pennsylvania DA Linda Kelly says, okay, we're gonna indict these two guys, Tim Curley and Gary Schultz, we think they lied to the grand jury. Joe Paterno is not a person of interest, he's cooperating with the investigation. And I remember watching TV that day and say, well, you know, at least in his final years, he'll be spared the worst of this. I have never been more wrong in my life about anything. And I'm not sure to, to this day how the Sandusky scandal became the paternal scandal. I mean, I, I have, okay, I have some ideas. I mean, he was obviously much more visible than anyone else at Penn State, for obvious reasons. He was a, an iconic coach of a stature that very few coaches ever get to. I mean, John Wooden statue, stature. Um, and he was very much the public face of Penn State. So in that, that I can see. But I think partly when ESPN and Deadspin got their hands on it, Paterno was the only thing they knew. They didn't know Tim Curley, they didn't know Gary Schultz, they didn't know Graham Spanier even. And it all became about what Paterno did or didn't know at what point. And then, I gotta say, the 1,000, 2,000 students who rioted didn't help because that made it all about Paterno, of course. And it made it all about football again. And I still have disputes about this. By the way, you can disagree with me about this. Um, Paterno was widely mocked after his death when he came out that he had said in December of last year, this is not a football scandal. I think I know what he meant. 
Child predators infest every single damn sport there is. In Canada, it was hockey, of course. We've had things in women's gymnastics. We've had things in volleyball, in, in wrestling. We've had the Boy Scouts. We've had the Catholic Church joining to mention, right? Little League. And anytime you have that structure where, you know, older men have the opportunity to prey on young boys, I know this, that football was obviously the vehicle. You know, it was, it was what would create as part of the allure. I mean, Sandusky himself was a defensive coordinator. But I think it could have happened almost anywhere. And I don't think the cover-up was about protecting the football program. I really don't. Uh, I can see why people would think that. And it's, it's entirely reasonable. But I don't see that if you go to the police, that the football program gets harmed. It's a horrible scandal. People would be horrified by it and disgusted and shocked and dismayed. But no one's going to say, well, the NCAA should close down that program because the guy who retired in 99 turned out to be a pedophile. It would be, it would be, it would be terrible, but it wouldn't involve the kind of penalties you're seeing now. So, you know, maybe they thought, um, uh, Curley and Shelton, whoever, maybe they thought they had to protect the program. I really don't know. We'll, we'll see what, what they say they dare in court. So anyway, what happened as a result of all this? Very quickly, really by, the, by Thanksgiving of last year, it became all about Paterno. And I think it stayed that way pretty much ever since. There was this moment of sort of uh, grief and hesitation after he died when it became uh, clear that you know, he feared his, his whole life that if he stopped coaching, he would die. And I think he was totally right to fear that. Um, <clears throat> he just didn't know what else to do with his life. And then, of course, he had lung cancer. Um, but then it went back after the free report was released in July of this year, it went back to really putting Paterno front and center, this time with the claim that he knew all about the 1998 investigation. And I've read that report. And as I said in my article today, I don't see any justification for that claim at all. Um, all we know is that at one point, Curley touched base with him. That's all we know. That's all that's in that report. We don't even know what touch base means. So maybe he knew about 98, maybe he didn't, or maybe they knew about 98 and said, ah, the police looked into it and everything's fine. But you know, how, I think common sense is not yet solidified around that. That said, as I mentioned in this essay, you've got, by one uh, poll, 28% of the American public now believing that Paterno himself molested those kids, 15% not sure. That's pretty astonishing. And uh, that speaks to uh, a way in which a certain kind of common sense um, gets formed and is very, very hard to shake. I mean, uh, different subject, but think of the number of people, think of the fact that the number of people who believe Obama is Muslim and were born outside the US has increased in the last four years. You know, not that I don't hear, now granted, that's a more politically driven narrative, but I think it obeys the same sort of logic. Once that sort of thing is entrenched, it's very, very hard to challenge. And this is, to back up just for a moment, one of the reasons I don't see that the reinforcement of common sense really should be one of the goals of the humanities, whether it's about Paterno, Obama, or anybody else, a lot of times common sense is just what we think when we're not thinking. Um, it could be, you know, folk wisdom. It could be, look, or it could be like the reasonable person standard in law, right? Look, this doesn't pass the reasonable, reasonable person wouldn't think this. In that sense, common sense serves us as, as a check, right, on really incredible flights of fancy. But it also can be just pure rehashing of whatever received wisdom has come down. And, you know, I, I think also that um, from what I can see of the comments on that essay, <laughs> uh, Chronicle comments, folks, I mean, I, I have the best blog commenters in the world. I, I, that's one of the reasons I miss it. Um, but it's very hard to maintain that kind of community of allowing people to debate and discuss with each other without getting personal, not getting nasty. Occasionally, a troll shows up in the dungeon, and you have to, you know, get someone to hurl a club at it or whatever you do with trolls. Sometimes, I mean, it was weird to me that of the six people I had to ban from my blog, all were academics. It was, a, it was a very strange phenomenon where you know, professors thought, oh, I'm in the blogosphere. I can take off all my clothes and dance on the table now, discursively. But from what I see, and I knew this was kind of going to happen, to a certain group of people, insofar as I am reassessing or even trying to open the question of, basically, I call it you know, uh, uh, adjusting the pie chart of culpability. I'm not exonerating Paterno for any of this, right? Even the most benign interpretation, the most benign interpretation is once he was confronted with this, he had no idea what to do about it. That's not exculpatory, right? That's a benign interpretation, but Phil should have known, somebody should have known to go to the police. Even if the police had investigated it earlier, you know, they botched that one. I don't know why or how, but they did. So to those people, I'm just a toady. 
I'm just like, you know, I'm a paternal apologist, right? And to the paternal fans, including some alumni, I'm just totally a traitor, which is weird. Today I, today I come to you as toady traitor. Not a lot of people can do that. Um, and I just don't know yet what, how that will, uh, um, how that will play out. What will be eventually the, the common sense, the, the received narrative? And I know, speaking about things not achieving a full and final articulation, the Curley and Schultz trials are until next year. And I, I promise you I'm keeping an open mind about it. If, if things come up in those trials that you know, totally set me on my heels, I will rethink stuff in a lot of new evidence. But this is what I've got for the moment. And what I've got for the moment says to me, I cannot even possibly address any of this scandal as the paternal chair. I mean, quite apart from the fact that I do think this legacy has been tainted in this way. You know, um, and I'm not sure that anyone <coughs> like me could undo that. But on top of that, even to say, look, you're wrong about some things. And the sports writers especially piled on with a, a really ridiculous and, and sometimes vindictive glee. Even to say that, I think I should be some other, other I should have some other title um, just for the optics, because otherwise everything I say looks bought and paid for as if I'm family spokesperson. Uh, but again, like, that's not going to be good enough for the, the people who um, believe that Paterno is entirely innocent of everything. Um, for them, resigning the chair is all they want to. That, that's that's quite enough. You know, I've, I've 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 done. That speaks louder than anything else I have to say to them. And I understand that. But in the end, um, obviously, I don't. Obviously, those considerations weren't sufficiently important to me. <laughs> yes, because it's a different thing. Yeah, I think it is. And in fact, I ran for faculty senate and I won. And now that and once I'm all, uh, once I'm off leave, I have to actually go serve. Um, and I, I still don't know exactly what um, I could get done as one faculty senator, but I want to be in on that. And I also want there to be an AEP chapter at Penn State to work together with the faculty senate on matters of, of shared governance and academic freedom. The one thing you wouldn't know, I'm sorry, I'm taking it into the weeds on this one. Before the Paterno thing hit, a lot of my colleagues and I were deeply upset about losing the program in science, technology, and society. And again, you know, I mentioned this, I remember that moment in the talk where I talked about these interstitial disciplines popping up in between disciplines? Well, the program in science, technology, and society, here after STS for short, okay, STS, you know, I first got to Penn State, I wasn't impressed. I, I, I met some folks, I guess taught a class or two, and I said, you know, these people, they hate science. And they hate technology. Almost as much as they hate society. <laughs> and I worked on that one. And also, in all seriousness, um, that's not a cheap line. These were very much, uh, no, there was like sort of an Ivan Illich cohort at Penn State. And for those of you who don't know, Ivan Illich, he was associated most uh, prominently with the idea of de-schooling. Basically, schools and other institutions like that, this is where you know, people warp and twist you and you have to be de-institutionalized, de-schooled. And so they really were you know, very much skeptical of society and all its trappings and very deeply critical of science and technology in a kind of granola way. <clears throat> Whereas I prefer my critiques of science and technology to be deeply informed by science and technology. And then five, six years ago, we hired all these great new faculty starting with Chloe Silverman, whose book on autism is just, the, the history of parental networks and autism just came out, got a great review from Adam Phillips in the London Review of Books. My point being, this is a real, this is a great person. We have this other guy <clears throat> whose work is on food security, which is totally interesting. And these people were gonna be let go by that decision unless people scrambled and found positions for them, you know, unless life rafts were built. And that decision to close STS was made by an administration heavy uh, uh, um, committee in which there was no elected faculty participation at all. Now, that doesn't render all their decisions illegitimate, but it ain't the way the AUP says it should be done. And I'm, I am the author now of the AUP report on how it should be done. <clears throat> it goes to Committee A two weeks from now, and who knows, it may be published next year, but I've spent most of my time this year working on that thing. <clears throat> that goes beyond Penn State, but as informed by that experience with Penn State, I had problems with the way administration was doing things unilaterally long before the paternal thing hit. Most of the things that 
you know, administration did while I was there were pretty cool. It was a really competent administration. And people, I think, were happy or at least um, passive about the centrality, uh, centralization of power because things seem to be going okay. All of a sudden, when things are not going okay, you realize, you know, that centralization of power and decision making, not so good. Now, why did I mention that in this essay? Um, two things. One, this essay was more specifically about the paternal chair. Um, I didn't want people imputing to me reasons uh, for my decision that, I, that are not mine. 